All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Austin Shinagawa, one of the PGY2 integrated BIR residents at uh, Kaiser LA. Um, we're here with uh, Nitin Egbert, Dr. Nitin Egbert, um, one of the academic hospitalists at UCSF, um, who's going to be continuing his discussion of medical management of um, uh, atherosclerotic disease with a talk on uh, nicotine cessation. So. Uh, his last talk on hypertension was excellent, learned a lot, and uh, looking forward to this one. Thank you so much, Austin. Appreciate it. Um, so for everyone just joining this series as well, typically I'm going to start with the basics and sort of work my way up from there. This talk is a little bit lighter than the other ones. Um, it's mostly about uh, what your options are for helping helping somebody manage their nicotine cravings and helping them succeed. Um, Secede, helping them secede from the state of having smoking, <laughs> helping them seize nicotine. Um, so we'll get into it here. Your learning objectives are fairly simple here. Review acute management for nicotine use disorder, because there are some things you can do for a patient even while they're in the hospital. This isn't all outpatient. Uh, and review the outpatient management for nicotine dis use disorder. Um, a lot of this is actually the same because um, your, your tools, your medications that you use in patient and outpatient um, are going to be very similar uh, and learn what medications can be used to treat nicotine use disorder because that's really, really what this particular lecture is going to give you a bunch of tools for your toolbox to talk to your patients and, um, and help them stop smoking basically. So um, we'll get right into it uh, by asking um, well, by talking about tobacco and nicotine use disorder. So there's about 21% of people who are active tobacco product users pre-pandemic. Those are 2019 numbers. The uh, survey hasn't actually been repeated since then. Um, and as you all know, tobacco and nicotine use disorder are highly correlated with vasculopathy. Um, you have PAD, CAD, CKD. Um, most of the things that you guys deal with as IRs are influenced by smoking. Um, and we've known that for a long time. So let's um, let's dive right into it. This is the first uh, poll everywhere thing that we have here. So feel free to take your time with this one, just join. It's an open-ended question. Um, what medications can you use to treat nicotine use disorder? What are you aware of? Um, and the link to join is right up there at the top. Um, poll EV slash Egbert 436, or you can text that to that number. And I'll just wait for a little bit to let people get into the session because we will be using this more over the course of the lecture. I'm not supposed to show you guys the question and the answer step. Varenicline. All right, we got one answer in. Yes, absolutely. Varenicline is a great option. Anything else you can use to treat nicotine use disorder? Varenicline is Chantix, of course. Uh, Nicotine replacement therapy. I'm sorry that it splits up. Um, pull, pull everywhere tends to split up if you send multiple words, but NRT or nicotine replacement therapy. Absolutely. There's one other one in the big three. That's it. That's the one. Be appropriate on. Excellent. Um, so the, the big three medications you can use to treat nicotine use disorder are nicotine replacement therapy, giving them nicotine through patches and other things. Varenicline, which is Chantix, really helps cut down on cravings. And bupropion, antidepressant SNRI, that is uh, also associated with cutting down cravings. Excellent, very good guys. Um, so you guys already know some of the main tools you have to use. I'm gonna to try to give you a couple of additional ones here. Let's give the slide a second to go forward. There we go. Um, so yes, nicotine replacement uh, with nicotine patches is actually kind of the mainstay of our therapy, especially inpatient. You can start nicotine replacement right away just to take the edge off somebody's cravings because you know that 
heavy smokers especially get very agitated if they haven't been able to have their um, nicotine in a while. Uh, acute inpatient management of tobacco use disorder. Nicotine replacement is our mainstay. Even inpatient, you can start nicotine replacement. Um, you're going to get a lot of better patient compliance, uh, a lot better um, outcomes on the social side of things. If right off the bat, when you admit your patient or you take your patient into your service, you ask them, um, hey, like, you know, how much do you smoke? Can I give you nicotine replacement in the meantime, just so that you don't, uh, you're not dealing with the cravings while you're in the hospital? Uh, so uh, 21 milligrams per pack, per pack per day um, is a good starting dose. Um, uh, 21 milligrams per day, sorry, um, is a good starting dose for anyone starting over half a pack per day, uh, which is 10 cigarettes. Um, and on discharge, you can taper down to 14 and seven, or you can keep them on the 21, taper down every four to six weeks as tolerated. Um, and you can give them those instructions as well. There's a little bit more than just nicotine replacement. You can give them oral nicotine replacement in the form of gum and lozenges. Um, and usually nicotine replacement therapy, when we say that, is best handled by giving them some baseline level of continuous nicotine um, and a little and gum and lozenges to basically take away the acute craving of wanting a cigarette. Um, there is coffee and acidic drinks that can impair absorption. So it's important to inform your patients of this, especially if you prescribe it inpatient, tell them to take it before they take their coffee in the morning, um, or it really will not help them much. So here's a, uh, a bit of a question for thought for you guys. Nicotine is the source of your patient's vasculopathy. Why am I saying nicotine replacement, even inpatient? Is, is it really a good idea in PAD? Um, and, you know, that has a straightforward answer. Actually, yes, uh, nicotine replacement, strangely, is not associated with increased cardiovascular mortality. I think the large part of that effect is because you're starting them on it with the intent of tapering off but do anything you can to get them off the tobacco slash the vape, um, and that will help. It may still have acute effects. So for instance, if you're admitting someone to revascularize a limb, might not be a great idea to start them on nicotine <laughs> replacement before you actually fix the limb, um, because it will still have um, acute vasodilatory effects on certain vessels and acute vasoconstrictive effects on other vessels. So um, nicotine is still nicotine. But uh, in the long term, it is not associated with increased cardiovascular mortality. All right, so um, inpatient management, you know, uh, is, is mostly a nicotine replacement therapy. Um, I'll pose this question to you just to sort of reinforce what's going on. If you're watching this after the session has been recorded, feel free to pause um, and just see if you remember what I mentioned on the last slide. You have a 42 year old female with a history of ESRD, PAD, nicotine use disorder, who's admitted with cellulitis and the need for revision of a fistula for dialysis access. Over the course of your intake, you offer her nicotine replacement therapy while inpatient to take the edge off her cigarette cravings. What's the appropriate dosage? We'll elaborate on this one a little bit as well. I'll wait for um, a couple of people to chime in. I don't think we have a lot of live responders. Um, so you got one result. Let's take a look at how the answers are looking. You can still respond to this if you're watching this live. Uh, 21 milligrams a day, that, that is the correct answer. Some facilities I will mention actually don't stock the 21 milligrams a day um, nicotine patches. I've run into that issue before um, and you'll only have the 14 a day available, but uh, 21 milligram a day, while that may sound like a high dose because it's the highest one available is actually the right thing to start. Anyone over half a pack per day you start them on 21 milligrams a day. Um, very good. All right, so that's it for the inpatient management, really. Let's talk about the chronic outpatient management of tobacco nicotine use disorder. You already know the first step. The mainstay is nicotine replacement therapy. Um, what can you add on top of that? Well, you have a couple more medication options, which we said in the first brainstorm session there. Uh, you have varenicline, which is Chantix. Um, and there are a couple of things to know with this one. There's no significant risk for concomitant use with other psych medications for varenicline, meaning you can start it alongside 
um, antidepressants and um, and other psych medications like uh, Haldol or well nobody's on Haldol outpatient these days but or, you know Risperidone or uh, Seroquel or other other psych medications. Um, Here's another question for thought. Does this need a screen for suicidal ideation? Because um, that's a common thing that we do, right? When we prescribe varenicline. Uh, the answer is actually um, no, uh, it doesn't. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go forward. Uh, it, um, it does need a screen for suicidal ideation. It does not increase the risk of suicidal ideation per the most recent studies. We still do it because some of the data is unclear. Um, the initial studies for venicillin suggested that it might increase the risk for suicidal ideation, so we still do it um, because it's the safe thing to do, and that's actually what you'll explain to your patients if uh, if they ask, you know, why are you asking me this? Um, bupropion. Um, if the patient is on other antidepressants, this carries a risk of serotonin syndrome. Bupropion is an SNRI. Um, so if they're on other antidepressants, just know, be a little bit cautious with this one. Does this one need a screen for suicidal ideation? Another question for thought. Uh, and again, the answer is we still do it. The data says that if bupropion is used for smoking cessation, people don't generally have an increased risk of self-harm or suicide. Um, but because of some of the uh, you know, increases in impulsivity people may experience on an SNRI, um, and because of um, uh, the sort of data on the other antidepressants, we still screen for suicidal ideation uh, because if they do have existing suicidal ideation, it's probably a good idea to deal with that before prescribing either of these medications. Um, bupropion has one other benefit. It carries a weight loss benefit for patients that are overweight slash obese. It's a very good one to mention for patients that may also want weight loss, which is also gonna be a large portion of your patients. And then there's nicotine replacement therapy. We've talked a lot about this. Again, um, best done with patches initially because those just give a continuous infusion of nicotine. Um, and if they have acute cravings through the patches, give them some gum and some lozenges that uh, they can take uh, to relieve the urge to smoke. And you can do nicotine replacement concurrently with bupropion or varenicline. It's actually best to do both NRT and one of varenicline or bupropion. Um, and most people have the best luck with that. Okay. All right, next question. Um, you have a 63 year old male with a history of obesity, CKD2, type two diabetes, major depressive disorder, insomnia and tobacco use disorder. Uh, who's presenting for follow-up at your office. Um, he's interested in weight loss and smoking cessation. Uh, and his current medications are metformin, 1,000 milligrams BID, azempic, 0.5 milligrams weekly, sertraline, 50 milligrams daily, and trazodone, 50 milligrams at bedtime. So which is the most appropriate pharmacologic management to start this patient on? And again, if you're watching this recorded, feel free to pause and take your time with this, think about it, um, and see what you would answer in this case. Um, and I'll drop a slight hint for this one. Um, remember that some of the medications have contraindications. This patient is on two antidepressants, both the sertraline and the trazodone. All right, so let's take a look at what the results look like. Uh, varenicline plus nicotine replacement therapy. That is the correct answer here. Um, bupropion plus nicotine replacement therapy might be an option. Um, but uh, because he's already on two different antidepressants, both with serotonergic activity, uh, you will greatly increase the risk of serotonin syndrome by putting this patient on bupropion. So varenicline is the right option here. Very good. All right. So more outpatient management. Uh, let's talk about some of the soft skills, behavioral and counseling options. You Use this with medication. Um, nicotine is a very addictive drug. Give them some medical help to break the addiction. Some people are resistant to it, um, but whether they're resistant to it or not, you should give them some of the counseling. So habit replacement is a very common thing to do for uh, uh, nicotine use disorder. Ask your patient what situations they're likely to reach for a cigarette um, or reach for their vape. A brainstorm with them. Is there some other habit that they can start using instead? Um, so things that I've given people, for instance, are carry around sugar-free lollipops, you know, pop that in your mouth. 
um, and um, use a fidget device. Um, there was a patient I had that liked uh, uh, solving Rubik's cubes. And I said, well, can you have that in your bag somewhere with you at work or like where you'd put your cigarettes instead and just play with that instead of using a cigarette? I'm like, yeah, I, I could do that. Um, and if they express that uh, they reach for a cigarette in a stressful situation, this is a very common thing, um, mention that there are both prescription and non-prescription things for stress relief. Um, exercise along with uh, uh, anyone trying to stop smoking helps a lot. That's been studied as well. It looks like I haven't cited that study here, but um, anyone who's trying to quit smoking, if they're on an exercise regimen, really helps them quit. Um, and uh, there's also things you can prescribe. Hydroxyzine is a non-addictive, um, it's just an anticholinergic and an antihistamine, right? Um, but it's very useful for acute anxiety. Uh, so one of the most common things, and this I've gotten with two or three patients, um, where somebody says, well, I am down to two cigarettes a day, but I can't cut those two cigarettes a day out of my life because my work is very stressful. Sometimes I just need to step out um, and, you know, take a cigarette. And that's the only thing that calms me down. Okay, well, here's another thing that you could use to calm yourself down. Um, and it doesn't have the nicotine in it, and it's going to help you break the habit. Um, CBD uh, plus minus, uh, it is actually very useful for people who are trying to um, calm down. Uh, it depends on what state you're practicing in genuinely, whether or not you can prescribe it. Um, and it also depends on what your opinions of that medication in general are. Um, I have had a lot of luck with that. Uh, it, the only uh, real people you can't use it in are people that have uh, cannabis hyperemesis. You don't want to give them anything that's derived from cannabis. Um, all right. Uh, and the other thing you should suggest to your patient is taper. Most patients do best if they slowly taper their smoking rather than quitting cold turkey. Um, and that usually is, takes the effect of just each week you find one of your cigarettes to cut out of the day, right? Uh, you just keep going down by one cigarette each week. You're taking 10 cigarettes the first week. Okay, you come back, come down to nine the next week. Um, if they can do it faster than that, well, good for them. Uh, support them all the way. Talk to them about that. Uh, for patients who can vape, you actually have two options here. You can recommend going down on the frequency of the nicotine, yes. Uh, but you can also ask them if they'd be willing to go down on the concentration of nicotine um, or the total volume per day, the volume per vape, because most vape solution comes in different concentrations as well. Um, and there's actually 0% nicotine concentrations for people who are trying to use that to quit smoking. Uh, they can actually use that, come down all the way to 0%, um, and then stop the vaping habit. Uh, and that is something you can suggest as well. But yes, good to replace the habit, and it's good to taper down slowly rather than just quit cold turkey. Another important thing of outpatient management, follow up, schedule follow-ups with your appointments, you want, uh, with your patients. You wanna do it every two to four weeks, encourage them. Even small improvement is improvement. If they improved initially and then backslid, still encourage them, tell them, hey, you did it once, you can do it again. Uh, you managed to cut down, um, maybe things were stressful when you came back up, ask them how you can help with the stress. I'll ask them how you can, uh, you know, a brainstorm with them basically to, to replace the stress, stressful things. Uh, connect them with other providers, give them an addiction medicine referral. Uh, if you're having trouble brainstorming with them or you're having trouble um, figuring out what exactly to do, uh, get them to addiction medicine. Tell them, um, and just, you don't have to do, if you're having trouble, you can do it for anyone. You can tell them, hey, let me hook you up with addiction medicine. They can really help you. Um, and a couple more soft skills that I wanna go over. Taking history. Um, we've kind of implied this here. You want to assess the amount of use really um, when you're talking to people. Um, and I do wanna go over a couple of these because these are um, atypical smoking things that you might run into. So most people smoke cigarettes, but some people will tell them, tell you, oh no, I smoke cigarillos, I smoke cigars, I smoke vape. So we've gone a little bit over the uh, vape stuff. Um, but most patients will actually know how many milligrams of nicotine they consume per day if they vape, um, because typically it's labeled on their uh, vape or their e-juice, like how many milligrams of nicotine is in the whole juice canister. Um, and if they go through, you know, one a day, then they know, okay, I go through 200 milligrams of nicotine a day. 
Um, and 200 milligrams of nicotine is one pack of cigarettes. You can use that to estimate your pack year history. So cigarettes, 10 milligrams each, right? There's 20 cigarettes in a pack. Uh, cigarillos, there's 100 milligrams of nicotine. So two of those is already one pack of cigarettes. And cigars, you'll run into some patients with cigar habits. A single cigar is pretty much a pack of cigarettes. Uh, it varies, honestly, based on the brand or um, of the cigars or the size of the cigars, but um, this is usually enough to estimate roughly what's going on. Um, you can also calculate for the vape case, I forgot to mention that, uh, from the percentage concentration of nicotine um, or the milligrams per milliliter concentration and the volume. All right. Um, other bits for counseling. So uh, this is gonna be your general template for any sort of counseling really, but first assess the patient's understanding of tobacco cessation on their disease. Um, what do you understand about the effects of nicotine on their disease? Fill in any gaps that you hear, correct any misunderstandings or incomplete understanding. Um, and when you're done with that, assess how willing, how willing they are to quit. Uh, ask them, would you like to stop nicotine use? Can I help you, right? And uh, usually uh, if somebody has been through some adverse event uh, or they've had to revascularize a limb, uh, they will understand how severe it is and they will wish that they could quit and they'll just be unable to. Uh, and that's when you offer treatment and offer help. And of course we've talked, sorry, scrolled forward a little bit too much. Um, and of course we've talked about what help that um, offer comes in, but these are some of the soft skills that you wanna do. Uh, before you get into all the offering help. Okay, so I think the rest of this lecture, as I said, this is a shorter lecture, um, are just practice questions. So um, I think most of you are gonna watch this uh, after it's been recorded. Uh, so I will give you a moment to pause, read over the question, decide what you wanna do. Um, and then I'll give you an explanation for uh, why the answer to the question is the way it is or what exactly I was thinking when I wrote the question. All right, okay. So first question, um, you have, you're discharging a patient with a history of tobacco use disorder. After discussing options, the patients would like NRT and varenicline. Which of the following should you do before prescribing varenicline? If you're watching this recorded again, take a moment, pause, think about what you'd do, um, and then hit resume once you're ready for me to scroll ahead. So it looks like screen for suicidal ideation. That is absolutely the correct answer. Again, um, it doesn't actually increase the risk for suicidal ideation per the most recent studies, but we still do it because we're not completely sure and we're doctors, we do the safe thing. Very good. All right, this is also a common conversation you'll have Upon screening for suicidal ideation before prescribing varenicline, your patient is concerned that a medication can, quote, mess with their head and make them hurt themselves. So what do you tell your patient? Does varenicline actually increase the risk of self-harm? If you're watching this recorded, you can take a moment to pause, but I know I just gave you the answer when I was discussing the previous question. And resume it whenever you're ready for me to give you the answer. So yes, the data does not show an increased risk of self-harm, but it's slightly unclear. The data is clear about how many lives are saved by quitting smoking. And that answer is my exact blurb for patients usually. I say, um, I say basically, we know that the benefit of taking this medication greatly outweighs the risk of harm. Um, we know that people we put on this medication are much less likely to die overall. Um, and we're not sure if um, it increases the risk for self-harm. Some of the early studies show that it might, but none of the recent studies show that it increases the risk for self-harm. That's why we use this medication. We know we save lives by quitting smoking um, and, uh, and we save many, many, many more lives than even the initial study showed we might uh, increase risk of self-harm for. Good. All right, next question, different patient. 46-year-old male with a history of hypertension, CKD, type 2 diabetes, PAD nicotine use disorder, presents for follow-up in your office for claudication pain, which you decide to manage medically. Um, 
you also want to stop the nicotine use, but what additional information can you obtain during the history to uh, determine the severity of the nicotine habit? Um, sorry, this is, uh, uh, forgot to give you the last piece of information. Takes nicotine via vape pen three to four times a day for the last 10 years. And again, if you're watching this recorded, go ahead, pause and resume whenever you're ready to give me the answer. And this question is a tricky question um, because uh, actually there's multiple right answers. The milligrams of nicotine per day, yes, that is the most convenient, least work on your end. Uh, most of your patients will actually know how many milligrams of nicotine they're taking per day. Uh, and 200 milligrams of nicotine is one pack of cigarettes. Um, many of your vape patients will be taking more than that uh, because it's very convenient, very easy to get high concentration vape. Um, and take a lot of nicotine. Uh, if they don't know how many milligrams of nicotine they're taking per day, you can actually also pick answer C here. From the volume and the concentration of vape fluid, you can tell um, how much uh, that they are actually taking per day because most vape fluid is la labeled by milligrams per milliliters, um, how many milligrams of nicotine that there are in that uh, vape fluid, and you'll know how many milliliters of vape fluid they go through per day. Very good. All right, another vignette here, uh, another patient, 53 year old male with a history of PAD, type two diabetes, CKD, nicotine use disorder, has smoked two cigars a day, which have up to 200 milligrams of nicotine for the last 20 years. What would his equivalent pack year history in cigarettes be? So again, if you're watching this recorded, go ahead and just pause for a moment, think about what your answer would be, and then resume once you're ready for me to give you the answer. And your hint here, which also gives away the answer, is just 200 milligrams of nicotine is a pack of cigarettes. Each cigarette typically contains about 10 milligrams of nicotine. Um, did I say two cigars a day or one cigar a day? Um, so I said, one, uh, so two cigars a day. Um, so 20 pack years, 40 pack years, really actually, um, I, I tend to go on the upper end of the estimate here. Um, so if it's taking two cigars a day, um, I, I would say 40 pack years here. Um, some people, some cigars will actually contain less nic nicotine. It's not an exact estimate, um, but because it's not an exact estimate, it's better to err on the side of caution. All right. One more, 60 year old female with a history of PAD, type two diabetes, nicotine use disorder was started on 21 milligrams a day of nicotine patches and varenicline two weeks ago. She reports she's down to two cigarettes a day but has been unable to cut down further because at work it's very stressful and sometimes a cigarette is the only thing that calms her down. What can you offer the patient to help? So again, if you're watching this recorded, go ahead and pause and then resume whenever you're ready to hear the answer from me. All right. So the correct answer is all of the above. Uh, these are all things I suggested earlier in the le lecture. Uh, habit replacement, sugar-free lollipops is a great thing. Uh, only thing uh, that I usually find is sometimes workplaces only allow smoke breaks, right? They don't allow sugar-free lollipop breaks. So you literally usually have to tell the workplace you're taking a smoke break, take a cigarette out and chuck it or have you know something other than a cigarette um, and use a sugar-free lollipop. Um, but generally, you know, if you're, it, it, that sometimes relies on having an understanding boss basically is what I'm saying. Uh, not always a possibility. Um, nicotine lozenges, you can also offer, right? Acute cravings for nicotine you can replace with uh, gum or lozenges. Um, and typically that can be handled the same as a smoke break. Bosses will understand that, workplaces will understand that. Um, hydroxine, yes, absolutely. It's a um, non-addictive medication that helps with acute anxiety. So um, we can also offer the patient that and say, hey, if you're having trouble with very stressful situations in work, can I give you a medication that would help with the stress? It's non-addictive, right? It's not a benzodiazepine. It's not one of those dangerous ones. I don't wanna replace your addiction with another one, but this really helps a lot of my patients. Um, so I want you to, I want you to have it if you want it. Good, very good. 
All right, um, that would be the end of this lecture. Um, it's a lot faster if you're watching this pre-recorded um, because usually I wait a little bit for people to think, uh, discuss, and uh, sort of answer each question here. Um, so if you have any question, you can feel free to email me um, and I hope to see you guys at the next lecture, which is our diabetes one. All right, thanks everyone.